Welcome to the Best Interest Podcast, hosted by Jesse Kramer, where we discuss today's best ideas in personal finance and investing. The Best Interest is a personal podcast meant for entertainment purposes only. It should not be taken as financial advice and is not prescriptive of your financial situation. Here's your host, Jesse Kramer. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode number nine of the Best Interest Podcast. My name is Jesse Kramer. I'm recording this on Sunday, April 4th. Happy Easter. Today, we are going to be talking about the biggest lesson from COVID-19, or at least what I think is the biggest lesson from COVID-19. It affects personal finance. It affects grocery stores, hospitals, small businesses, large businesses. It even applies to walks in the woods. I think it's an interesting topic. And then I'll answer a listener question about the one thing, the biggest one thing that you can do to improve your personal finance. If you had a person who knew nothing about money, knew nothing about investing, what's the one thing that I would recommend they start thinking about? So it's a cool listener question. So with that, I think we're good to go. Let's start the show. Margin, room for error, a safety net, insurance, a parachute, risk reduction, bench depth, So many phrases, but they all represent the biggest lesson from COVID-19. And if we don't pay attention, we might be doomed to repeat our mistakes. In its simplest form, Slack, or any of the other terms I just used, it represents an extra resource that we build into our systems, even if we think our probability of using that resource is low. Slack is your spare tire. So for the first 100,000 miles, let's say, your spare tire, pretty much, it's just dead weight. All it does is drag your car down, it reduces your gas mileage, but when you pop a flat in the middle of nowhere, something magical happens. In an instant, that dead weight becomes the most important feature on your car. Slack feels wasteful, until suddenly, it doesn't. In March 2020, we saw those lessons everywhere we looked. Some of them were sad and painful, others were funny, though probably annoying, they all, share, they all shared a common wake-up call, a shared reminder, that if you don't give yourself some cushion, a sudden impact could jar you to your core. For me, at least, it's obvious that this is the lesson to learn from COVID-19. So a quick reminder, uh, President Trump banned flights from Europe on Wednesday, March 11th, 2020. On the next day, Thursday, March 12th, that's when a lot of schools around the country started closing. And that's when it really hit home for most Americans. But I felt lucky because I had a fortune teller in my corner, if you will. A full two weeks earlier, on February 26th, I got the following message. Quote, We're making common sense preparations for a four to six week don't go to the grocery store because coronavirus is here situation. Rice, pasta, canned goods, coffee, toilet paper, bleach, etc., We don't think this is paranoia. We don't think it's overkill. Because here's my real concern. If, and it may happen, if government orders uh, the schools closed, then shit will really hit the fan. And that will drive the seriousness home to the masses. And the masses will flock to the grocery stores. It's still weeks away, but some really bright folks at the CDC say, expect substantial disruption to daily routines. Just food for thought, a fortune teller. End quote. Wow. Is it just me, or was every aspect of that prediction correct? Now, my dad, that fortune teller is my dad, he wasn't the only person who saw the writing on the wall. But this prediction, back in late February 2020, it made me go down to my basement and take a hard look at my pantry. Were there enough calories to support two of us at home for a multi-week lockdown? The answer was no. So I consider myself pretty lucky that I was able to go to the grocery store in late February, stock up on some non-perishables, don't worry, it made zero dent in the store's supply at that point in time. And when things got crazy in mid-March 2020, I was able to stay home and essentially ignore the outside world. Now, what's the worst that would have happened if my fortune teller was wrong? Now, what you know, is there a big deal with having a shelf full of non-perishables in the basement when you really don't need it? What I'm saying is that in this particular case, the cost of slack was very, very small. But when half the population realized simultaneously that they didn't have any slack, you got empty shelves at all your local grocery stores. 
and the chain reaction that occurred from empty store shelves, I think it's even more interesting than the, the, sto- the empty shelves themselves. Uh, one of my readers and listeners, Faith, she star- uh, shared this story with me, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here. Uh, Initially, Faith felt no compulsion to rush to a grocery store, but on Friday, March 13th, 2020, she happened to stop by a local Wegmans just before work just to grab a coffee. But when she saw the state of the store, that is, bare shelves, she realized, if I wait to do my normal shopping this weekend, there might not be anything for me to buy. So she changed plans, she grabbed a cart, she picked up some essentials right then and there. It's a perfectly normal reaction, and it's exactly what I would have done. So what's interesting is that the first wave of, say, fear, for lack of a better term, it induced a second wave, and the second wave induces a third wave, and the feedback loop of fear, it grows stronger. People who initially remained calm, they might realize two or three waves in that there's not going to be anything left for them unless they act now. It's reminiscent of the FOMO FUD cycles that occur during booms and busts in the investment markets. When we realize that there isn't enough slack in the system, our what-if monkey brains do what's needed to survive. And that's why building slack into our lives has to be a lesson that we learn. But, usually, slack has some cost. And I know some of you are thinking right now that I'm telling an incomplete story. Because slack, usually, is inherently wasteful. And one should do a cost-benefit analysis to figure out if slack is worthwhile. I completely agree. And for a quick example, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let's look at two hypothetical frequent flyers. Ernie is always early and shows up two hours before his scheduled departure, but Conrad cuts it close, only showing up one hour before departure. And let's say that their airport, the security there, gets jammed up about 10% of the time. And that's when Conrad, who cuts it close, he finds himself in trouble. On those days, those 10% of days when security is jammed up, he misses his flight. And he loses, let's say, six hours getting rerouted to his final destination. Ernie, meanwhile, he's early. He makes his flight every time. He builds more slack into his schedule. And he certainly seems better off for it. But is that actually true? So there's a cool quote from the economist George Stigler who says, quote, If you never miss a plane, you're spending too much time at the airport, end quote. It's a funny it's a funny example, and, and we'll show what he means, because the math for Ernie and Conrad, it's pretty simple. Ernie wastes an hour on 90% of his flights, and 10% of the time, that hour is actually good that he built it into his schedule. So 90% of a wasted hour every time, that's 0.9 hours per flight that Ernie quote-unquote wastes. Conrad, on the other hand, he wastes six hours getting rerouted on 10% of his flights, or 0.6 hours per flight. So Slack, it would appear, is hurting Ernie more than it's helping him. He's wasting more time at the airports than Conrad. Of course, this is a straw man. I understand. I built this argument. I chose the numbers. And who says Ernie can't be perfectly productive while waiting at an airport gate? But there's an underlying truth that you should keep in mind throughout the rest of this episode. Slack can be a double-edged sword. Slack will waste one resource, time or money, in order to preserve another resource, usually something like our ability to make 100% of flights or our ability to drive home after getting a flat tire. Slack is rarely free. Early data and predictions of COVID-19 suggested that it would disproportionately affect the poor, and that has mostly played out to be true. Low-income workers, they tend to work in closer quarters. Lower-class populations tend to live in denser neighborhoods. Viruses spread better in those kind of situations. Whereas middle or upper income workers might be able to work from home, lower income workers have to work jobs that cannot be done from home. Manufacturing, it can't be done via Zoom call. Store shelves can't be stocked using group chat. And while middle and upper class uh, workers might be able to weather the storm of a furlough or a layoff, lower income workers are more likely to be operating paycheck to paycheck. That is, their personal finances tend to have less slack, less cushion built in. They would have to ask themselves, do you go to work? Do you interact with other people? Do you increase your risk of catching COVID-19? Or do you stay home and find a way to survive without a paycheck? How do you reconcile the public pleas that were going on in the spring and summer of 2020? Pleas for social distancing, pleas to flatten the curve when you can't make ends meet. Stimulus packages were great starts. 
But I think the lack of safety nets that existed in our socioeconomic systems, they caused problems during COVID-19 and they could continue to cause problems in the future. Uh, let's switch over to hospitals because the world's medical systems, they learned about slack in some of the most painful ways. Typically common supplies like N95 masks and ventilators were the limiting reagents preventing safe and effective treatment of COVID-19 early on. That was the sad side, a very sad lesson from COVID-19. I might point you, listener, to some of the images that came out of Italy in early 2020. Italy is a, a modern country with a modern medical system, and they had patients dying in the hallways without medical care because there simply wasn't enough to go around. So um, transitioning back, the entire social distancing movement was purely about buying our healthcare system more slack. There's a great quote from Adam Butler. Social distancing is successful. It will be viewed by most as unnecessary in retrospect. This is the essence of risk management and why so few manage risk. End quote. What Butler is saying is that there's this catch-22 around building slack into your system. Uh, most of the time, it's unnecessary. And when it does work, a lot of people on the outside will take the slack for granted. And they'll just see the end, they'll just see the result, they'll see the success, and they'll say, ah, did you really need the slack in the first place? So that's what risk management is. It's about building slack into your systems. And when it works well, uh, it's easy to take for granted. And that's something that I think we did and might continue to do, but I hope we learn our lesson. Uh, the medical system, in the United States at least, it's capable of handling sudden shocks when they happen to come from one specific area. So a great example of this is the way that hospitals reacted in the tri-state area on September 11th, 2001. Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, those hospitals were able to soak up some of the incoming patients from New York City and, and handle that disaster as best they could. Uh, but COVID-19 is widespread. It's attacking or it attacked the medical system everywhere at once. The normal method of slack, which is hospitals helping hospitals, it was no longer effective. So now we face a hard question. Should these hospitals have built up more margin as individual organizations? Should each hospital system have a warehouse somewhere in the suburbs with 100,000 masks and 1,000 extra ventilators? My instinct is no. That's not the answer. We can't expect every organization to have a contingency for every situation. Just like our airport travelers, Ernie and Conrad, there would be a tremendous inefficiency for each individual hospital to build that amount of, uh, amount of slack into their systems. Materials and drugs would expire, machines would require maintenance and certification, and 99% of the time, those things would just collect dust in that warehouse. But there is a reasonable solution. It's what the U.S. already does with annual influenza vaccines. There was a great Planet Money podcast episode that explained how the U.S. government provides funding to private pharmaceutical companies to create flu vaccines. This, in effect, is the government's way of injecting slack into the system, guaranteeing that there will be a vaccine for next winter's seasonal flu. In the same vein, the U.S. government uses taxpayer dollars to fund and supply the National Medical Supply Stockpile. These supplies exist for times exactly like the COVID-19 pandemic, or at least they did until the charter language of the NMSS was changed in March 2020. Um, thousands of ventilators that the government did have in storage, they didn't work because the federal government got into a contract dispute in 2018-2019 with their maintenance company, and no maintenance meant broken ventilators. The slack that previous administrations had created had been wasted by another administration. And why? To bicker over price. So again, the whole idea of slack it has these economic incentives involved that kind of muddy the waters. It makes it a complicated issue. There were also slack issues in the business community. Our economy was reeling in March and April of 2020, and some businesses, they handled the pandemic better than others, and slack tended to be the differentiator. So let's look at the airline industry. Specifically, the following data will pertain to Southwest, Alaska Air, Delta, United, American, and JetBlue. Those six companies, they had a whopping $49 billion in free cash flow over the past 10 years. But in March 2020, the airline's revenues, they were way down. Nobody was flying. 
to keep businesses operating, that free cash needed to be used. The airlines, they could have used that cash to pay their pilots, their mechanics, their stewardesses. They could have kept their fleets maintained, paid their recent debts to their suppliers. The cash flow gives the airlines slack. But I've kept one important fact from you, and that fact is that out of the $49 billion in free cash over the past decade, those six airlines, they already spent $47 billion of it to buy back their own stocks, which we've gone over before here on the on that Best Interest podcast. It pretty much just props up the stock price and puts more money into, into uh, the stockholders' pockets. Shareholders tend to also be involved in the leadership of the company, the C-suite. So as a result, those airlines found themselves cash poor in the face of mounting bills and uh, the oncoming pandemic, and they needed the federal government for a bailout. Uh, I'm reminded of a great quote from Seth Godin, Quote, the mistake happens when we over-index on the easily measured short-term wins and forget to account for the costs of system failure. Good quote, Seth. They weren't trying to help you, the flyer. The executives wanted to pad their own stock portfolios, and it seems like they neglected to account for the cost of system failure. While capitalism demands that companies use their free capital to pursue profits, just like these airlines did, It also punishes companies for acting stupidly. When a multi-billion dollar company knowingly burns its own slack in pursuit of more profit, why is it up to Joe and Jane taxpayer to bail them out? This lesson was ripe during the 2008 crisis, and it looks like it's going to be a lesson from COVID-19 as well. I don't know if we're going to learn our lesson this time or not. But does that same thought process apply to small businesses and startups? Because Ma and Pa's bakery, it works a little bit differently than Delta Airlines. Ma and Pa, they never got to decide what to do with their billion dollars of free cash flow. Smaller companies, they typically operate on small margins. Perhaps they have a few thousand dollars of free cash per year. And if Ma and Pa choose to reinvest that cash into their business, can you blame them for that? What's wrong with buying a new oven or hiring a helping hand when the need arises? Need arises? Red puns? Unlike uh, anything with the airline's stock buybacks, a bakery's reinvestments directly lead to improvements for the consumer. More bread, better cookies, cheaper prices. This is the good side of capitalism. Ma and Pa win, and you and I win. Small businesses, they have to choose between growth and slack. And you can't blame them if they lean towards growth. It means that Ma and Pa might now be 30 days from insolvency because they bought a new oven last autumn. They did that to make better bread with you in mind. Now, I think we owe them a helping hand, and I'm glad to see not only my local government, but governments all over the country and all over the world stepping in to help out small businesses. This was a good lesson from COVID-19. And my last funny lesson about Slack, it takes us to the mountains, to the woods. Have you ever been on a day hike spending 10 plus hours in the woods? If not, you might not know that that you've got to pack a ton of stuff for these kind of trips. When you're miles away from civilization, you need to prepare for the possibility that nobody can come and save you. Therefore, every what-if question needs to be answered by something in your backpack. When the hike is done, you get to take off your backpack and realize that you carried 20 pounds up and down a mountain pretty much for nothing. You didn't use any of it, or you barely used any of it. This happens over and over again, hike after hike. But then one day, your friend's dad might slip and land knee first on a rock. What's his kneecap doing in the middle of his quadriceps, you ask? Oh shit. And that's the day I realized the importance of carrying that heavy gear up and down the mountain. When emergency hits, you can either build a splint for his knee, or you can't. You either have a satellite phone to call for help, or you don't. Slack is there to help you, or it's not there to help you. There's no in-between. It's scary, But this level of preparedness is a lesson from COVID-19 that we'd all do well to reinforce in our lives. A few easy questions that come to mind. What scenarios in life call for slack? How often might that scenario arise? What would happen if you didn't have slack when you needed it? Is it catastrophic failure or just a minor annoyance? And how much would it cost you in terms of money, time, energy to maintain that slack? P.S. That kneecap incident is a true story from my first real hike in the Adirondacks. My friend's dad slipped on a rock five miles up a mountain, and his kneecap was dislocated by about eight inches, and it was kind of scary. But anyway, when this pandemic is actually over, 
how will we reevaluate our systems? And what will we do with this lesson that we've learned? On a personal level, perhaps you'll keep a few more dry goods in the cupboard. Maybe you'll make a personal finance goal of building up your emergency fund. But as a community, we also need to rethink how much room for error we build into our societal systems. We need to plan for the fact that similar events might happen in the future. Pandemics, natural disasters, maybe even alien invasions. Who knows? Our systems will need to endure similar shocks again. We can keep the status quo and get in fistfights over Charmin, or we can learn, build, build some slack into our lives, and be better next time around. Let's transition over to a listener question. And this is a semi-anonymous listener question this week. I really like it. And the, the hypothetical that was posed to me is, imagine that you have a person who is doing absolutely nothing in their personal finance and investing life. And you want them to start. And they only have one thing. You say, this is the one thing that I want you to start thinking about to improve your personal finances. What would that one thing be? For me, that answer would be budgeting. I think that is the place to start. And the nice thing about budgeting is there's there's a wide spectrum of ways that you can budget. Uh, for example, I probably fall on one extreme end of the spectrum in that I track every dollar that comes into my bank account, everything, every time I get paid, every time I receive a penny, I track that using my app called You Need a Budget. And every time I spend money, whether it's a dollar coffee or $75 at the grocery store or $400 to replace the brakes on my car, every single expense goes into my budget. So that way, I have a complete story of my spending. At this point, that story has been complete. I've been budgeting this way for about 30 months. So for the past two and a half years, I can tell you every single little expenditure I have, I can show you how my grocery spending has gone up and down over time, those kind of things. So at the end of the month, every month, I know, did I spend too much this month? Was I in a good spot? Did I earn more than I spend? I can answer those kind of questions, and over time, I can start to improve my personal finances in particular ways. But you don't have to budget like the, the zealot that I am. You can choose a much, much simpler path. And I'll, I'll link an article in the show notes with some different options that I've written about on the blog. And one of the simplest ones is just look at your bank account on the last day of every month. That's it. Start writing down the numbers of your checking and savings at the end of, at the end of each month. And you can start to notice patterns. And you can compare the month end March to the month end February. Did the numbers go up? Well, that's good. That means that you saved money in March. You can compare month end April to month end March. Did the money uh, did the numbers go up? Oh, they went down. Okay, well since they went down, that means that you spent more money than you earned in April. And maybe you should look at the details a little bit finer and understand where did you spend money in April and why did you end up in this position where you spent more than you earned? It's just one day a month. Uh, at best, it's going to take you 30 seconds. You just look at the number. You say that your number went up. You saved more than you earned. You're good. At worst, maybe it takes you 10 or 15 minutes because you realize that you spent too much money and you want to go into detail a little bit more to understand where that spending happened. As long as you're thinking about the money that you spent and as long as you're trying to understand some of your own behavior as to why you might be overspending your budget, in my opinion, that's good. And over time, you'll start to realize ways that you spend too much, and hopefully you'll start to address those leaks in your budget, and you'll fill them up, and your personal finances will improve. So if I had to recommend one behavior to a person who's doing nothing in their personal finance life, uh, that behavior would be to start a budget. Good question. All right, guys, that's all I have for episode nine of the podcast Thank you so much for listening. As usual, I'm extremely appreciative if you could take a few seconds to uh, leave a rating and leave a review of the podcast. It helps me out in the long run. I'm trying to build this project out. So far, so good. Uh, I think the podcast has been received amazingly well. Thank you all so much for the feedback. And if you haven't had a chance to leave a rating or review yet, that'd be my one favor that I ask of you. I'm going to keep on producing this, this content. I'm going to keep on trying to answer your questions and be entertaining. Um, 
other than that, that's all I got. You know, feel free to share the podcast. I always appreciate it when I see people sharing it out there. And the reason why is because an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. That's what Ben Franklin said. So thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to episode number nine of the Best Interest Podcast. <laughs>